Good morning and welcome to First and Summerfield United Methodist Church. I want to invite our lay leader, Bob Hancock, to give you a greeting as well. Good morning. I'm Bob Hancock, co-lay leader at First and Summerfield United Methodist Church. One of the problems of reading history is that you occasionally get what Yogi Berra called a deja vu moment all over again. In 1967, I was on an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean when the Six Day War broke up. A spy ship, the Navy spy ship, the Liberty, was jumped on by Israeli Navy forces and the captain of the Liberty sent out an SOS which the Saratoga and the aircraft carrier America tried to respond to. I have never seen airplanes with so much junk underneath them taking off to go to war. The America had, and so did the Saratoga, the America had what we call special weapons airplanes they had something underneath them that was wrapped in canvas, and nobody talked much about it. The America's captain launched these special weapons airplanes to get them out of the way. The only thing the Pentagon knew about was that he had launched the planes. Our planes, cooler heads, um, survived, and... Our planes were called back. The America's special aircraft planes were landed. And we steamed off to the western part of the Mediterranean to get out of trouble. Five weeks ago, Israel was attacked by Hamas. This week, American forces attacked an ammunition dump in Syria. And once again... I'm wondering, what are we getting ourselves into? But today, God's beautiful sun is up there in the skies, giving us a brisk mid-autumn Sunday and making this truly a glorious day to be alive.
You may be seated. Let us join now in unison to the prayer of confession. God, we want to follow you and be close to you, but we confess that sometimes we are in such a rush to get it right that we forget to do it together. Help us to stay awake to the world around us and to remember that nobody is free until everybody is free. Hear the good news. There is room for all, sinners and saints alike, at the banquet of God. Come as you are to the feast of love in the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let us join. Please rise in spirit or in body for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel this morning is taken from Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, 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 open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know 
neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. to Ms. Maggie. Okay. Oh, some, some of the adults too. That's great. That's great. Okay. So you heard that it's about light and lanterns, right? That's what that was about. Yeah. Okay. So today I thought I would bring a candle so we could talk about some of the light that was, that was in. Can, Colette, can you hold that for me? Okay. Um, Nadine, can you hold this for me? I got to dig through for my matches. You were listening too closely. <laughs> yes, I, I did not actually forget my matches. I, in purpose, did not forget my matches so that we could talk about the story. Very, very good, Helen, for picking that up. <laughs> so what happened in the story? They had one job. They had one job, and all they had to do was keep their lamps lit. And what happened? They forgot. They were, the foolish wives for a well, they were the foolish bridesmaids for a reason. Yeah, they didn't, they weren't prepared, right? Just like I didn't bring my matches, so I can't light the candle, right? So here's the deal. We could light it up there. It's at, yes, we could. They, I was, and actually, I was going to extend it and ask Adam if he had matches in the back, like there was going to be a whole thing, but you figured no. it out. You figured it out too quick. Um, no, so obviously in the story also, like, I think if I asked Adam, if I said, Adam, could I have a match, odds are really good that Adam would say yes. He's actually, he's going to get one right now. You don't have to. It's okay. <laughs> in the story, the prepared bridesmaids are like, no, no, if we share with you, we won't have enough. So you got to go to market because this was your responsibility, right? I think in some ways this is a parent's favorite parable because parents are always on about, did you pack your backpack? Do you have your water bottle? Did you do your homework? Are you prepared? Right? No, so here's the deal. When we know, when we know what we have coming, it should be easy to be prepared. It, it, not if you're foolish, but it should be easy to be prepared because we have all the information in front of us, right? But how many of us have like way too many things to keep track of in our brains? Right? Right. All the grown-ups now. <laughs> right? There's just so much going on. It is so hard to be prepared all of the time. So one of the things that I think the scripture is saying to us is to try to be mindful about the important things, right? When you have one job and there's a wedding, like, maybe you should be prepared. That's your one job. Do that thing. So the important things, remember to be prepared. But also, it's saying that sometimes we don't know what's coming, and we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention and be aware of what's going on around us, right, so that we can be ready. Okay? So that's my story. We're going to go down and do some stuff in Sunday school. We're going to talk about waiting for God because that's also what this story was about, right? Um, and we're going to talk about sometimes how it's hard to wait. And we're going to say a little prayer together. Are you ready? All right. Dear God, thanks for bringing us together here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you for helping us to be prepared when we need to be and for helping us learn to wait and be ready when we don't know what's coming next. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. Abby, do you want to? Should I go ahead and use this one, Abby? Would it be better to use this one, or? We don't know. 
Okay. Good morning. Let us join together in an attitude of prayer. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One thing that I often regret is writing acerbic emails at 3 a.m. in the morning. And there was this one time I wrote an email to a bunch of Quakers, of all people, and I was criticizing them as gracefully and grace-filled as I could at 3 a.m. in the morning about their unwillingness to live up to their own traditions in providing sanctuary to folks facing deportation. But I'll never forget how my friend Kika Matos responded when I did that, because I copied her on the email. Kika said, you are woke, she said in her email. I didn't know exactly what that meant, so I, and I fear really in these days, this day and age, that the term has been misappropriated by the far, far right wing Fox News commentators the likes of Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson refer, refer to the woke mob derisively. But I delved into it and have determined to wear the phrase or term with a badge of honor. Woke is defined in the Merriam-Webster dictionary as aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues, especially issues of racial and social justice, and identified as US slang, it says. But I delved a little further into that um, source of all good information, the internet, and it referred me to a site called Urban Dictionary. And it says, although an incorrect tense of awake, it is a reference to how people should be aware in current affairs, i.e., like while you are obsessing with the Kardashians, there are millions of homeless in the world. Stay woke. Of course, accompanied by a hashtag at the beginning. The Urban Dictionary goes on to say that getting woke is like being in the matrix and taking the red pill. You get a sudden understanding of what's really going on and find out you were wrong about much of what you understood to be the truth. It goes on to tell me that Erica Badu used the term stay woke in her 2008 song Master Teacher. By 2011, the phrase had begun to gain popularity as a way of describing an informed, questioning, self-educating individual, which is essentially how we use it today. It makes me wonder that if the writers of the gospel had had this phrase in their lexicon, whether they might have used it to describe our responsibilities in waiting for Jesus' return. Stay woke reminds me of the, the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane who kept falling asleep and found it hard to be woke as they needed to tend to their responsibilities to Jesus and to God. It reminds me of how often I find it difficult to be woke as I attend to my responsibilities to Jesus and to God. For I think that Jesus and God expect me, expect us to stay woke. After all, that's what this parable is about today, right? The five wise and five foolish bridesmaids waiting for the groom, keepers of the light. The wise ones were attentive to their responsibilities. But the foolish ones, well, not so much. They didn't. When they realized they were going to need that oil for their lamps, when the groom was arriving, it was too late. 
they had not stayed woke. And they were shut out of the kingdom when the groom showed up. How do we stay woke? How do we self-inform, self-educate, and become aware of the social justice responsibilities we all share? One of my friends in the social justice work talks about a movement from mission to justice, a movement from the self-education phase to the activist phase. So perhaps you start volunteering at the downtown evening soup kitchen and end up supporting policies that reduce food and income inequality in this country. But there was another thing that popped up on my email screen just yesterday. And it's an area that I hope this church will be a moral voice in. Because I, I feel like this church stays woke. They did so in the sanctuary movement. They've done so in housing refugees. So let me tell you how and what's going on. Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut is helping to lead negotiations with Republicans on the budget and raising the debt ceiling. The group, including Murphy, is considering in negotiations putting the asylum system as we know it on the chopping block, negotiating away protections that asylum seekers who come to our border enjoy. It would basically eliminate the credible fear interview that takes place when an asylum seeker comes to the border and it's conducted at ports of entry for asylum seekers. It basically would say, you got to wait outside the country while your asylum case is being determined. This protection has basically been a part of the asylum system ever since the news spread that the U.S. turned back a boatload of Jews seeking refuge here from Hitler's gas chambers. That shameful part of our past became a basis for the modern asylum system as we know it. There's still time, though, if we stay woke, to make our voices heard by Senator Murphy. Call his office. Flood it with phone calls. Jam up his phone lines. Sign the letter being circulated to protest that this is even being considered. Come to the protest on November 17th at the Federal Building in Hartford. Tell Senator Murphy we would no more turn away asylum seekers at our border than we would the Holy Family itself. Join me in joining the woke mob, the Jesus mob, if you will. Because I believe we're being called as Christians, disciples, to be ready, be attentive, be attentive to be if you will, woke. May it be so. Amen. Please rise for the singing of the hymn, Seek Ye First.
be seated. Does this, is this mic working? Can I, am I, okay, great, great. I will go ahead and um, relay the joys and concerns from the sanctuary and then um, I believe that will be handled by, oh, uh, by, by um, <laughs> Abby, Abby, sorry Abby. Very somber morning and I can appreciate that with everything that's going on in the world. Um, let us join our hearts and voices in prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you to support the ministries of this church, either giving online or giving in the um, box in the back. We will now enjoy a, a selection while you fill out those cards. may be seated. Want to call for any announcements we might have from the sanctuary? Virginia Reed? Oh. I was invited to do a stewardship event. Oh, great. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. I don't think it's printed. Oh, no wonder. Like I said, it's not printed. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Again, I was asked to give a stewardship moment. Um, reflection this morning. So I'm just going to get speak for a moment about what First in Summerfield has meant to me during my time here and um, just think about giving and how we can give in many ways to this congregation and the community. So as you know, uh, or you might not know, I'm a PhD student here at Yale and um, went to Yale for undergrad and then went to other grad schools and and worked and and then came back and in fact um, before I came back in the year before I came back I connected with first in Summerfield in my position working in Washington DC um, for the General Board of Church and Society and specifically as it happens with Reverend Paul Fleck who uh, as he has mentioned is quite involved in immigration justice work and so um, I really saw that connection and felt that connection as um, a blessing, a grace from God to know here's a United Methodist congregation that is engaged in the community and engaged in a way that's actually quite singular and unique um, and not something we often see, but 
by being a model and a light of what it means to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, um, first in Summerfield, at least for me, um, working in D.C. and I think for other churches really shows what's possible in, in our Christian faith congregationally. And so um, fast forward to when I came here uh, as a student in the midst of COVID and, you know, no one was meeting in person, it was still meaningful for me to connect with this congregation, knowing the justice um, role that it plays, but also more so how that justice is rooted in relationships. So offering sanctuary um, to, to various people, um, asylum, support, um, all of that is built on relationships and it was really a blessing for me to connect one-on-one -on -one with um, all of you <laughs> um, and to really become part of a body of Christ that is doing justice, but not just like, you know, rah, 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 <laughs> in, the, in the very visible, showy way that can really define social media and everything today, but, but doing it in a more heart-centered, personal, like feet on the ground sort of way. So that's just some of what First and Summerfield has meant to me. Um, and I'm reminded of that each time I log on, on Zoom or come in person. I will say, um, this church means a lot to me, especially given that it doesn't look or sound like most churches that I've attended in my life and that I have kind of find most personally fulfilling in terms of like gospel tradition. <laughs> and it's just very culturally different, but I embrace the difference. Um, I'm grateful for all that you have given to me and I encourage if you're listening um, to just think about and reflect on what this church means to you. I think that's a wonderful thing to do each time we give. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jeannie Ree, and I really appreciate your words. And uh, um, yeah, it means a lot to me too. I, I really, uh, um, and it's the, the connections that you make, you know, people like, John and Maggie Carr, who invited me here, and um, um, Ad Tucker, who, you know, when I was doing my internship, she said, now is the church you're doing your internship, is it an integrated church? And I was like, no. <laughs> you know, I just felt, I, I, and she wasn't judgy about it, she was just challenging, which, you know, church people aren't often that way, and it's, it, was, it was a wonderful thing um, that I was challenged in that way. Um, and I think about Carl Puleo and all the saints that came before who uh, valued this church and were steadfast in their march for peace, their, 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 their vigil for peace on the steps of this church. Um, so yeah, um, supporting this church is hugely important in what they do. So thank you, Jeannie Ree. Let us join together in our closing hymn I want to walk as a child of the light. United Methodist Hymnal 206, as printed in your bulletin too.
As light bearers, it is our responsibility to keep our lamps trimmed, filled with oil. Stay awake. Stay woke. Amen.